What's up, y'all? We are rolling into week 14, and life isn't easy when you're trying to win a fantasy football championship. We had coaches throwing us curveballs, knuckleballs, you name it, last week. We've got players trending up. We've got players trending down. And guess what? We've got to know. Can we trust them in our lineups? Furthermore, should they even be on our roster? And that's why I've been in the utilization bunker, as usual, grinding on all the data to bring you the information, the data that you need to make informed decisions to help carry you through the playoffs. So the prodigal son returns, DeAndre Swift, a player that many of us spent a late first round pick on. Maybe some of you used an early second round pick, regardless, someone that we expected a lot more out of this fantasy season. He got injured been out a while, came back, didn't really have the role that we had seen before. But guess what? In week 13, things looked really good. So let's talk about his utilization. So for the first time since the very early part of the season, we saw Swift with a 50% plus snap share. He had 51%. And guess what? It wasn't just late in the game due to a blowout scenario where they were maybe resting Jamal Williams. No, this happened in the first quarter. He had 50% of the snaps in the first quarter, 49% of the snaps in the first half, 45% of the rushing attempts. That is the key. We actually talked in week 12 about Swift expanding his role in the passing game. That was already coming back. And now to see him at this rushing share, almost near 50%, that puts him in really great territory. And so since week eight, when he came back from his injury, we had really noticed that the rushing attempts weren't there. And guess what? The passing game role had also dissolved. We don't know if it was due to injury. We don't know if it was due to a rift with the coaching staff. Maybe some combination of both things. But over the last couple of weeks, we have noticed that Swift is no longer on the injury report at the end of the week. Then in week 13, a major difference across the board in all of the categories. It does look like the utilization is back for DeAndre Swift. And an important thing to remember with Swift, like any player, it's not just utilization. That's the number one thing we need, but we also really want to be invested in talented players. And even though this has been a guy that's been playing through injuries, has had a lesser role, all of the underlying data points still point to very positive things for DeAndre Swift. He has been above the league average, whether it's in missed tackles force per attempt, 10 plus yard rushing attempts yards after contact, all those things look really good. But the thing we love the most about DeAndre Swift is his ability to demand targets. And right now he ranks sixth in the NFL and targets per route run at 25%. That is an elite company. It's not much separating him from the very top guys. He's in the same breath as guys like Austin Eckler. And then if you look at his yards per route run, 1.57, also an elite number for a running back. So not only is he demanding the looks, he's doing a lot with it we have the perfect combination of talent and utilization. So here's the big thing with DeAndre Swift. When his utilization profile is lined up somewhat similar to what we saw last week, and this is capping it, whenever he's in games that he doesn't get at least 60% of the rushing attempts, and also excluding games where he's seeing an 80% route participation because he didn't see those things last year, excluding all of that, if you just focus on the games like what we saw last week, he averages 22.6. PPR points per game. So he's in that sweet spot, even if Jamal Williams continues to be involved and say maybe gets 30 to 40% of the rushing attempts, still is a touchdown, there's still going to be room for Swift to perform. In fact, I've moved him up in the utilization report to a mid-range RB2 with RB1 upside. That means he's a must start in week 14. So week 13 was wild. We've got injuries. We've got backfield shakeups. We've got some players just continuing to underperform, and we need answers. Well, guess what? We've been working on something behind the scenes that's very special. Some might even call it foolproof. The Utilization Magic 8-Ball. And we've got five burning questions for week 14, so let's shake it up. The first question is James Cook taking over the Buffalo backfield. The Utilization 8-Ball says... Cannot predict now. Here are the reasons why. First of all, we still had Devin Singletary very involved. Yes, we saw Cook with a season-high 43% snap share, season-high 40% rush rate. He did lead the team in both those categories, but the thing we're not hearing about is Naheem Hines. He was actually on the field as well for a season high since joining the Bills. He had a 31% snap share, and he handled 63% of the snaps inside the 10-yard line. That means we could just as easily be headed for a running back by committee times three plus Josh Allen still involved versus having a complete takeover by James Cook. 
James Cook, he should absolutely be rostered. You want to have him as a stash, but you need to avoid him in week 14 in your fantasy lineups. Question two, are there any under the radar handcuff running backs that we should be stashing for the fantasy playoffs? Utilization eight ball says, without a doubt, we have two of those. Jordan Mason for the 49ers. We saw last week with Elijah Mitchell out. We got some clarity. He was the backup to CMC, handled 18% of the snaps and 22% of the rushing attempts. While that's not a player that you can use in your lineup, if something happens to CMC, we have a good chance for Mason to be the lead back, even if it is some sort of committee. He probably immediately moves into the RB2 conversation. Another guy that hardly anyone is talking about is Joshua Kelly of the Chargers. In his second week back off of IR, he fully took over the number two role behind Austin Eckler. We saw Isaiah Spiller with 0% of the snaps. So that leaves it all there for Spiller. 41% of the snaps, 41% as well of the rushing attempts. If something were to happen to Austin Eckler, another guy that would probably squarely be in the RB2 conversation immediately. Question number three. Utilization eight ball. Is there any hope of Sky Moore breaking out this season? My sources say no. We've had Moore unable to top a 35% route participation. This is despite the fact that Juju Smith Schuster has missed time. Kadarius Tony has not been able to get on the field. And Nicole Hardman has also been out. That leaves only MVS as well as who? Justin Watson? Have any of you even heard of Justin Watson? This is who Sky Moore can't get on the field in front of. In fact, they've just gone to three tight end sets rather than giving more routes to Sky Moore. I think at this point, we just have to call it what it is. And if anyone is still willing to buy into those Kansas City vibes, he's a player, especially in Dynasty, that you can move. Because even when we look at all of his numbers and we go back historically and we go back to 2011 for guys that were drafted in the second or third round, guys with a similar PFF receiving grade and a similar targets per route run, the list of comps is not good. So number one is Kenny Galladay. And I'm sure you're immediately thinking, Dwayne, time out. Kenny Galladay? How is this a comp to Sky Moore? Kenny Galladay is tall. Sky Moore is a shorter receiver. Sky Moore wins more on separation. Kenny Galladay wins more on the contested catch. And you're right. And guess what? In the end, I really don't care about all that. All I care is if he can get on the field. And when he's on the field, will his quarterback target him? Because guess what? NFL quarterbacks, for the most part, are a much better judge of talent than you and I. And they're going to throw to the best players on the field. So when we come back to Kenny Galladay, similar draft capital, very similar across all the other data points that we want to talk about. And guess what? Yeah, he did have a couple of nice seasons, and he's the best one on the list, though. That's the problem. The next guy, Nicole Hardman, his teammate, has not been able to break out. Second round pick, very similar across the board. We have Dante Pettis. How do you guys feel about Dante Pettis? Denzel Mims. Dante Moncrief. Now, last year, we did have Rondell Moore, so there's a positive. That's a guy that a lot of people thought might be washed, was able to come back and play really well this last season before getting injured. Now, I will say, with Rondell Moore, his targets per route run, 24% his rookie season versus 19%, so he was almost an outlier within this group. And then we have, to round out the list, Justin Hunter and Vincent Brown. Some of you have probably never even heard of Vincent Brown. And guess what? It doesn't matter because Vincent Brown never broke out. So... We're not saying that there's a zero chance that Sky Moore could break out. And yes, the upside is nice because if he does, he plays with Patrick Mahomes. You're in a pass-heavy offense. So maybe there's a little bit of an extra reason to want to hang on to him or not just give him away. But I still think when you hear the list, when you play the probabilities out, the better move is to move on from Sky Moore. Question number four, is CMC back to a full-time workload with Elijah Mitchell back on the IR? Guess what? You may rely on it. We have now had two games without Mitchell, and in both of those, we have had CMC eclipse the 80% snap share, and guess what he's scoring? 40.3 and 28.6 fantasy points. In week 13, he handled 47% of the attempts, 77% route participation, and the really big thing, 100% of the short yardage. A lot of that work had gone to Mitchell. And we also know that Debo can sneak on the field and steal some of those as well. So for the touchdown upside, this is really good news for CMC. He is back to being an every week top three lock. And for our final question, Magic Utilization 8 Ball. Can we trust Jeff Wilson back in our lineups for week 14? The outlook's not good. Wilson was the backup to Mostert this last weekend, despite having taken over the backfield, starting with his first week 
When he was first traded over to the Dolphins, he handled 50% of the snaps. He only increased his workload since then, and it made us all feel nice and comfy. We thought, wow, look at this. Jeff Wilson's going to get 60 to 65% of the work every week. Raheem Mostert is really just the backup. This is the guy that can score 15 to 20 fantasy points per game, and we had the rug completely pulled out from under us. The problem we have here is it is Mike McDaniel. Where does he come from? The Kyle Shanahan coaching tree. What is that coaching tree known for? The hot hand approach. We really don't know what's going to happen moving forward. It could be Jeff Wilson back into a full-time role. It could be Raheem Mostert repeating what we had seen earlier in the season. Or it could just be whichever one of them looks the best on the first or second drive and they go with one of them or they could just split it. There's just so many different scenarios here. So if you have a better option on your bench, you've got to bench Jeff Wilson. He is really like the best way to describe him is to call him a hope and pray RB3 in week 14. 